Okay, I hope everybody can hear me. I see some nods. Uh, I'm Mark Robinson. I'm chair of the Commonwealth Human Ecology Council, and I'm delighted to welcome everyone to Czech's Earth Day webinar, Climate in Crisis. Um, in addition to Zoom, this event, event will be recorded and live streaming on YouTube, so please turn off your camera and remain on mute. Regarding questions, please put these in chat on Zoom. Uh, and if on YouTube, please ask any questions in the comments section. That's what I've been told uh, to tell you all. Uh, Czech is very pleased to be doing this webinar in partnership with the National Liberal Club's Commonwealth Forum. And I'm delighted to see its chair, Trevor Peel, um, with us um, this afternoon. Um, and I'm also delighted to be working in concert with the Ramphal Institute, of which I am also a trustee. Uh, <clears throat> climate change is right at the top of Czech's uh, agenda, and as it is with the Ramphal Institute. At the last Chogham in London, heads of government approved the Commonwealth's Blue Charter. The Commonwealth Secretariat has put sustainable development and climate change at the top of its agenda. And this um, has the support of Rwanda, which is hosting and chairing the next Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in the build-up to COP26 in Glasgow. I'm pleased that Emily Robinson, perhaps I should add no relation, uh, has agreed to be our speaker. She has 15 years experience in investment banking and financial services and is currently Chief Operating Officer uh, and Financial Officer at Pico Analytics. She is also currently studying renewable energy at the European Center of Technology and has been mentored by none other than Nobel, Nobel Laureate um, and former Vice President Al Gore, uh, who I have also had the pleasure some years ago now of meeting. Since joining Czech's govern governing board in November 2020, Emily has been a great asset in regard to our work. After she finishes speaking, a response will be given by David Gomez, who is director of the Ramphal Institute, who has an impressive international background, uh, including being, having been Belize's deputy head of mission to the World Trade Organization, and has completed many other roles with ComSec, the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, the EU, and much else besides. In addition to being our respondent, he will also be in charge of the discussion question process, which will take place after he has um, finished um, doing his work as a respondent. Finally, um, sorry, finally, and in addition uh, to having our respondent, sorry, finally, the webinar will be closed out by uh, none other than Kamala Palmer, who has taken over from the late Patsy Robertson as chairman of the Ramphal Institute. Before that, she was well known uh, in London as the Belize High Commissioner and chair of the Board of Governors of the Commonwealth Secretariat. I'm now absolutely delighted to give the floor to Emily Robinson. Uh, Czech has today, uh, in, because of, um, or in concert with Earth Day, has issued the journal it has produced on um, human ecology pollution. Uh, this has about 17 articles in it. It's available on Czech's website and um, has been prepared and made ready for the forthcoming Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. Emily. All right, thank you very much, Mark. Go back. Um, so thank you all again for taking part in the session. Uh, first, I'll begin with a brief explanation about the basic science and impacts of the climate crisis, and then about the solutions and movements being spearheaded, especially by young people. Um, I hope this will be informative and help you to have meaningful discussions about the climate crisis. So we like to start out with this photo of our planet. This is the first ever picture taken of the Earth fully illuminated. It was snapped on the last day of the Apollo missions and it changed the way that humanity thought about our common home. It reminds us that we're all connected and that our actions have an impact on the planet. 
This is the horizon of Earth, and it illustrates how thin the sky actually is. It's not the vast expanse we see when we look up at it from the ground, and it is vital to sustaining life on Earth. So now onto the basic science. Energy from the sun comes to the Earth in the form of light radiation. That energy is absorbed by the Earth and warms it. Some of the energy is re-radiated from Earth in the form of heat. And some of the outgoing heat is trapped by the atmosphere, which is a good thing. It's kept our planet at a stable temperature. Now, however, we've been thickening that atmosphere by filling it with heat trapping pollution. More heat energy is trapped and it is warming our planet at an unprecedented rate. That man-made heat trapping pollution is being turned out at a rate of more than 150 million tons every day into that very thin shell of atmosphere. And that's the problem. It's coming from many sources, as you'll see in this next slide, such as agricultural practices, forest burning, transportation, and industrial processes. However, the main source and cause of the rising global temperatures we're seeing today is the burning of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels still provide more than 80% of the world's energy, and its use and emissions have gone up dramatically since World War II. In the last few years, there was a leveling off as the world adopted more and more clean energy solutions until another recent spike in global warming pollution. This in turn is causing global temperatures to rise. Here is year by year the temperature record. And as we can see, 2020 is tied with 2016 for the hottest record. In fact, all 20 of the 20 hottest years ever measured with instruments have been since 2001. You'll see I've added 1998, which wasn't in the last 20 years, but I included it because temperature tied with 2002, 2006, and 2012. And alarmingly, the six hottest years of all have been in the last six years. The same is happening in the world's oceans. This chart demonstrates global ocean temperature anomalies, similar to the air temperatures over land that I just showed. 2020 was confirmed to be the hottest year ever for ocean temperatures. And what we can see about this temperature record is that half of this increase has been in just the last 20 years and it's continuing to build up. On a global basis, more than 90% of all the extra heat energy trapped by our atmosphere is going into the oceans. This heat not only helps create ocean dead zones, affects marine animal and plant life, but also makes ocean-based storms like hurricanes, typhoons, and cyclones stronger and more destructive. The increase in destruction is because the water cycle is now being disrupted. The amount of water vapor that evaporates off the oceans increases as this ocean warms. The water vapor is carried over the land and often falls in much bigger precipitation events. And when the land can't absorb all the water that falls in these larger storms and downpours, we see floods and mudslides. Extreme precipitation events like this supercell storm over Glasgow, Montana in the States have produced more rain and become more common since the 1950s around the world. These extreme events have led to record flooding. For example, this picture of flooding in Tamil Nadu just a few years ago. Now my in-laws live in Chennai and were without power for six days and had to get provisions by boat that was organized by local council and community leaders. They lost their car due to the flooding, but thankfully were on the third floor of their building, so didn't lose their home like many of their neighbors on the lower floors. Mm -hmm. And luckily they had a backup generator and a double filtration system for their water for drinking. So they were able to help others in the building with clean water and charging mobile phones in order to contact relatives, uh, work and local pharmacists and doctors for emergency medical supplies. And looking at the world as a whole, you can see how these big precipitation events have been gaining in frequency and the damage they're doing has been increasing. Uh, but sometimes people wonder how global warming can be blamed for causing more precipitation and flooding and at the same time more drought. Well, the extra heat trapped by the rising levels of greenhouse gases actually does lead to both. And as the climate changes, precipitation patterns also change, leaving some places with less rainfall than before. Southern Brazil, for example, suffered a devastating drought in 2015 and 16. And looking at these climate disasters as reinsurance companies look at them, you can see that the rising costs are really threatening to overwhelm the industry as a whole. In the last decade, we lost $2.5 trillion for climate-related extreme weather disasters. 
That's an increase over the previous decade of almost $1 trillion. And the projections are that this is only going to get worse. These droughts and hotter temperatures are also the cause of wildfires. The hotter the temperature is, the more fires there are. This statistical correlation has been proven out exactly over time. In fact, one of the hottest months on record in the Arctic in, was in June last year. Fires there released more CO2 than the entire annual emissions of Norway. And these hotter temperatures in the Arctic are also causing permafrost to start melting. Emissions resulting from this are very large and concerning because they're now equal to the emissions of Japan and Russia. And that's a serious category. Because in 2019, Russia and Japan were the world's fifth and sixth highest emitters of CO2. Meaning that the entire Arctic has now made a transition from being a net carbon sink to a net carbon emitter. <laughs> Many of the consequences of the climate crisis were highlighted as far back as 2014 by the US Department of Defense, which warned that if immediate action wasn't taken, there would be a huge risk of food and water shortages, pandemic diseases, and climate refugees in the coming years. This is turning into a threat that could get a good deal worse because the climate crisis is making some areas that are now populated literally uninhabitable, forcing people to leave their homes and migrate to more habitable climates. Right now, the areas deemed uninhabitable are relatively few, but here's what the scientific community is projecting over the next half century. These shaded areas are really significant and the conditions, unless we act, are due to become so harsh that people can't live there. And of course, long before that point, they'll feel it coming and migrate to other areas. In fact, the world as a whole could see up to 1 billion climate migrants by the end of the century. Another consequence of global warming and hotter than average weather is the effect on Arctic sea ice. You can see that in the last 1500 years, the amount of ice in the Arctic has collapsed pretty significantly. And the melting of sea ice has a potential catastrophic effect on coastal cities around the world. In terms of population, these cities are the ones that are the most affected, many of them in South Asia. And nearly one third of the world's population, around 2.4 billion people, live within 100 kilometers of a coastline, further emphasizing the vulnerabilities associated with increased sea level rise. From the standpoint of a value of assets at risk, you'll see trillions of exposed assets in many coastal cities around the world. In my home state, New York, New York City was only third on that list, but has $129 billion worth of real estate in flood zones. So purely from a cost standpoint, developers, owners, and investors should be worried. And of course, low-lying Pacific Island nations and low-lying islands everywhere are taking the brunt of the effects of sea level rise. Kiribati was the first nation in the world to purchase land in another country so that its citizens can go somewhere else when the sea takes over. And just this past December, the Marshall Islands became the first country to submit its national adaptation plan, to the UN's framework convention on climate change, effectively their national survival plan due to rising sea levels. And the climate crisis is also affecting the world's food supply. Crops are sensitive to warmer temperatures, reducing yields of maize, wheat, and barley in the tropics. And projections for declines in crop yields of significant amounts of corn, wheat, and rice uh, and soy. These four crops make up two thirds of the calorie intake for humanity in the world. So when you see these kinds of drops in yield, that's very serious for those who are already food insecure. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has warned that we may reach a threshold beyond which the current agricultural practices will no longer be able to support large human populations. Climate change has also contributed to many serious health problems around the world. According to the US CDC, these are the most significant climate change impacts on human health. And the last issue I'm going to mention, but one of the most important to human health is air pollution, which many people are surprised to know that causes between seven and nine million deaths a year worldwide. 
according to the World Health Organization, more than 91% of people live in areas where air quality exceeds their guideline limits. So that was the end of the first part of my presentation. Now I realized that was a lot of information to take in in the last few minutes, and this may lead some to have a bit of eco-anxiety um, if you already hadn't had it before. The American Psychological Association defines eco-anxiety as a chronic fear of environmental doom. Many people have a feeling of helplessness or anxiety when it comes to the current state of the environment. And I thought I'd mention quickly what happens when some people experience this, including myself. Uh, some may choose to ignore or bury their heads in the sand over it, or some use this to help educate, learn, and take action against climate change. In 2015, I was reading about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, uh, which has been around for decades, but that had only recently gained serious media attention. I was completely shocked. I remember discussing it with a friend who one day while we were having lunch and, and she basically said, please, please stop talking about it. I don't wanna know, I don't wanna hear about it. It's, it's, that's, it's too crazy and sad. And the more I wanted to discuss it, the more they just shut down and didn't wanna talk about it because I guess, I guess they didn't do anything about the problem. So, and then I remember thinking that at the very least, I need to educate myself as to why this massive plastic was already at the time, something like twice the size of France, and I was only just hearing about it. I looked into it a bit more and found that plastic from as early as the 1940s had been floating around the patch, and this so-called patch had increased in size each decade by a factor of 10. This has also given me great anxiety, although at the time I didn't really know that eco-anxiety existed. Um, I thought about that stray straw I may not have recycled, the takeaway containers that couldn't be recycled, and the toothbrushes I just thrown away. I imagined I'd caused at least one of the size of France's with my not so sustainable habits. I started off by implementing better recycling, water usage, and electricity habits, and made a real effort in reducing food waste. I read journals, I did research, and signed petitions to governments and companies um, asking them about their sustainability habits. I then attended the One Planet Summit in Paris and eventually joined the Climate Reality Project in 2017. I learned that one person could do a lot and at the very least, I would learn more about climate change and the causes and educate others who may be just as in the dark as I was at the time. I think a lot of people that have eco-anxiety eco and many especially young people have taken this fear and turned it into a strength to spark a movement or join existing movements with their own contributions. Youth activists all over the world are getting involved in different ways. For example, last November, six Portuguese children and young people brought a historic court case to the European Court of Human Rights, arguing that those states have failed to solve the climate crisis and they're breaching human rights. Only one month later, the court agreed and fast-tracked the case. And now the 33 named countries have to respond with information about how they're going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And these types of cases are only growing in number worldwide. Youth activists like Jamie Margolin, who helped found Zero Hour, a youth-led group advocating for climate action. She's met with world leaders, politicians, and celebrities, led climate rallies with tens of thousands of people, and helped plan international protests, all just from her high school. As she recently joined a group of children suing her home state, Washington, for violating their constitutional rights by contributing to climate change. And just today, Tia Bastia, a, a Mexican-Chilean climate activist and member of the indigenous Mexican Atami Toltec Nation, was one of two young people that gave an inspiring speech only probably about two hours ago at the 2021 Leader Summit on Climate. She is one of the major organizers of Fridays for Future New York City and has been a leading voice for indigenous and immigrant visibility in climate activism. These actions are inspiring more and more young people to get involved and in turn inspiring others to join the fight against the climate crisis. And we're seeing marches and demonstrations and demands at the ballot box for changes necessary to solve it. In a recent poll conducted by the UN Development Program called People's Climate Vote, 
about 1.2 million people of all genders, ages, and educational backgrounds took part with a significant number of younger people, um, just over half a million between 14 and 18 years old, and they submitted their answers. Um, and what they found was that over 60% agreed that climate change is a global emergency, when not that long ago, it wasn't on that many people's radar. Happening. Two great examples are last year, the World Economic Forum helped coordinate the One Trillion Tree Initiative. And the Great Green Wall Initiative across Northern Africa has since 2007 been planting millions of trees in the Sahel region, which should be completed by 2030. The wall will restore 100 million hectares of currently degraded land, sequester 250 million tons of carbon, and create 10 million jobs in rural areas. More encouraging news is that global coal plant construction is on the decline. And 117 global financial institutions announcing they're not going to provide any more financing for new coal power plants. And over 30 countries have now joined the Powering Past Coal Alliance, a coalition of participants who have committed to phasing out coal power in either their country, city, state, or funding it for those members that are organizations. And of course, we have renewable energy solutions that could replace carbon intensive fuel sources that humanity is reliant on. 20 years ago, the best available projections for wind energy were that the world might reach the installation of 30 gigawatts by 2010. However, when 2010 arrived, we beat that projection by 22 times over. And over the last 25 years, global wind capacity has really taken off. One of the things that's driving this is the cost is continuing to come down every single year and will only continue to get cheaper. In 2019 and 20, renewables gave Germany more energy than coal, helping them achieve their 2020 climate target. We're seeing that in a lot of other countries. Last year, Portugal went 52 and the UK went 67 days straight in a row with no coal-fired electricity. By the end of 2025, Europe will have nine countries that run on coal-free electricity. And wind is one of the reasons why. If you look at the total amount of wind energy that's available in the world, it could supply over 60% of the world's energy needs. To supplement that, we can look at solar photovoltaics. The Earth gets as much energy from the sun in one hour to fill 100% of the entire world's energy needs for one full year. As we increase the fraction of the energy we're able to harvest and use, we can see it's clear that we don't need fossil fuels for energy in the future. The next main goal will be able to harness most of that energy. 18 years ago, energy projections were that solar the solar market might be able to grow by one gigawatt per year when we reach 2010. Well, again, when we reach 2010, we beat that goal by 17 times over. And by 2019, globally, that goal was beat 121 times over. We can see the global increase in solar photovoltaic installations over the last 40 years, particularly in the last 20 years has been incredible. And like with wind, this is also due to the cost decreasing. It gets cheaper every single year, already much cheaper than fossil fuel electricity in most of the world. And global economies are moving forward with renewables. This 10 year period of global investments in renewables versus fossil fuels is showing that in 2009, they were nearly on par. But by 2013, renewables took the lead. And by 2019, there were three times as much investment worldwide in renewables as in fossil fuel electric electricity generating capacity. And examining all new electricity generation built worldwide in 2019, 80% of that was wind and solar. Renewables overtook fossil fuels in Europe last year for the first time ever. They rose to generate 38% of Europe's electricity compared with 34% the year before. This is an important milestone in Europe's clean energy transition because it also means that Europe's electricity in 2020 was 29% cleaner than in 2015. At a country level, I already mentioned Germany, but Spain and the UK also achieved this milestone for the first time. 
and renewable capacity additions are on track for a record expansion of nearly 10% this year globally, with India expecting to be the largest contributor to the upswing this year. The country's projections for renewables will almost double from last year. And in the EU, capacity additions are forecast to increase as well. And this is made possible largely in part to the price of batteries dropping. And when you add the storage batteries to solar and wind, what you get is a dramatic transformation of human civilization. Here you can see it in motion. Seven years ago, electricity from solar and wind was cheaper than electricity from fossil fuels in only 1% of the world. Five years later, it was cheaper than fossil fuel electricity in two thirds of the world. Only three years from now in 2024, it's projected it will be cheaper in 100% of the world. So we can see this revolution in motion and it's really impressive. So humanity went through the agricultural revolution 8,000 years ago. We went through the industrial revolution and more recently we've gone through the digital revolution. We are now in the early stages of a sustainability revolution that has the magnitude of the industrial combined with the speed of the digital revolution. This will be a key to solving the climate, the climate crisis. But as we see, people around the world are joining this revolution for a better future. So join those who are using their voices, votes, and choices in life in the marketplace to fight for their future community and world. And I invite you all to use your voice, votes, and your choices like your world depends on it. Because your world depends on it. So I thank you all for your time. Um, we'll pop the further reading and resources in the chat and work out on sharing on social media for those on, on YouTube that are interested. Thank you. Emily, thanks very much for that. Um, I think you raised quite a lot of information in there that I will try to respond to. Um, and you, there, I probably will start from, from the end of your presentation and go and, and track back a bit, because I think it was interesting that uh, uh, to look at the patterns for uptake of renewable energy or just the production capacity and what's happening there. Just this morning, the International Energy Agency, or it was maybe a few days ago, announced, and it was picked up by the news by Bloomberg, reported that the rebounding demand for fossil fuels will trigger a large increase in carbon emissions in 2021. So they're talking specifically about coal here, um, that will eclipse, that, that carbon emission in 2021 will eclipse the steady rise of green power sources which is just an astounding uh, statistic to, to have to, um, to swallow at this point in time, knowing the climate crisis that we're faced with. So you, you made that call now to people to join uh, the, call, uh, um, the forces of who's uh, uh, acting on, on the matter. And I think it's important um, that the Washington Post um, last year put out an article called, called the Environmental Burden of Generation Z. And essentially what they were talking about in that was that uh, kids, young people um, were saying, we, don't, we won't die from old age, we will die from climate change. And I thought, wow, uh, that just really hit home. And it reminded me of a consultation I held with about 22 youth in, in mid-February from across the Commonwealth. Um, and we were just talking about uh, why youth were not plugged in on the matter of air pollution. And the statement that left uh, uh, just a deep impression on me from that was that all of them were in agreement when one said, we are inheriting a world that we did not create. Um, but I thought about it, I thought, but well, yeah, the behaviors of humanity over the last decade, over the last two decades, over the last century and a half contribute to the situation we have now. Um, and there is a growing awareness about climate change um, across the Commonwealth, but globally. 
and at all levels of society. So older people know more about it. Younger people know about more about it. The private sector certainly knows uh, a lot about it and public sector knows about it. Civil society is acting in every way possible to do, uh, to try to meet its own little objectives. And sometimes those things don't all mesh, they don't all come together. But I think the call that went out in 2007, 2008 to, kind of migrate from being climate aware to having action on climate change is, is one that's more pressing uh, now um, than ever before. And I think the awareness of climate change and its impacts have proven to be insufficient to mobilize people to action. Um, you shared the story of your uh, in-laws and or your family in, in Chennai and in southern India. I think that is what people are, that's what drives people to, uh, to act. Their personal and direct experiences with climate emergencies, with environmental emergencies, with environmental situations. Um, I mean, everyone seems to know about climate change, but we all um, tend to think about it in a different, we have different ways that we view this. So uh, while everyone looks at the world and says, yes, um, we have a climate crisis, um, their experience has influenced them differently and how they view that. So at the end of the day, they may all agree that something has to be done, but there is no consensus on what should be done. Um, and in that process then, uh, they continue to have misinformed perceptions or actions or attitudes which continue to contribute to, uh, to a growing climate emergency, which is the eco-anxiety issue that you talked about. And, and a lot of youth suffer that. So there were the early uh, youth activists who became involved in environmental issues and climate change issues. And I, and I think for them, it was the re an early realization uh, that heightened emotional, mental distress over the fact that they will be inheriting a world that might be unlivable, uninhabitable, if this current trend continues. Um, the, the phrase was actually coined, eco-anxiety was actually coined in 2017 um, by a Australian psychologist, uh, environmental psychologist. And it's often used to refer to chronic fear of, uh, of environmental doom. Um, but I think the, the, the Climate Psychology Association, I didn't even know that existed. I mean, the fact that that even exists is, uh, says a lot too, uh, sees eco-anxiety as not necessarily being a bad thing. Um, they, they argue that it could be a healthy, it could engender a healthy response to ecological threats uh, or the ecological threats that we're all facing across the world, um, food and water shortages that you mentioned, the extreme weather that you mentioned, the species extinction issues, increased health issues that everyone is experiencing from air pollution, all the deaths. Um, that range of emotions, anger, sadness, grief, and depression are all there. But it doesn't signal a helplessness. And what you're seeing in, in the climate action from young people I think suggests that they're now speaking out saying, well, yes, we're faced with all of this, but we're not helpless. And that's a very powerful message, I believe, um, because today's children, today's young people are overwhelmed by the increasingly dire predictions, <clears throat> sorry, that we hear every day on the news. Oh, it's going to, you know, we're going to be burning up in, a, a, in another hundred years. Uh, we won't be able to breathe properly. Uh, we won't have food. We won't have so the messaging around it has created this this um, uh, overwhelming anxiety for young people thinking about well, what is this environment that is that we actually have to try to live in in another few years? Um, I think it's it's important that 2030 seems to have been established as the global tipping point for uh, to avert the worst consequences of global warming, um, and I think that was set. In 2008, when they said if, if by, or to 2018, when they said if by 2030, we don't meet these thresholds or we continue to exceed them, this is a situation that we'll be faced with. So um, the fact is that kids now have to be raised to look towards a future where 
Um, there's, it's a seamless, hopeless outlook where you're figuring, well, and I think that's where the eco-anxiety is coming from for a lot of that's driving that engagement and climate change. But it's also the experiences that family members are having, that families are having, that societies are having now about, well, now we've had for the fourth or fifth year, uh, the hottest summers ever. Or you may have that in the middle of winter, you have a week where it's really hot and the weather is just pleasant. And you know, you're, you end up having this uh, feeling of blissonance where uh, you're, you're enjoying the sun, but then you're thinking, wow, what does this mean for the future for everybody? So it's, it's not just the eco-anxiety, but it's all of these other emotions that people are going through. That feeling of blissonance was like, oh, well, now it's cold in places like in Belize where we can have these nice, not close in the Caribbean, not close to a white Christmas, but a cool Christmas, which makes it nice. But then all the people on the environmental side are thinking, what, is that, what, what does that mean for climate change? What does it mean for these changing weather patterns? And, and so you have people who, who suffer from, from what has been termed, um, and I think John had shared this with us, solastalgia. And solastalgia, the way I interpret it, the way I understand it is, is nothing more than hope, the homesickness people feel when they are still living in the environment that they grew up in but they can no longer recognize that environment because of all the significant changes it has endured. Which is an, it's an interesting concept that I suffer from solastalgia. So it's like, oh, wow, it's like, what did that mean? And I think you find all of these uh, um, young people are agitating towards that. And in truth, I believe that what that does is it, young people are already armed with outrage uh, and information and have a unique role to play in I think addressing climate change as you were pointing out and the environmental crisis but they need to be better informed so that the actions that they're taking can then help to drive the policy changes that are required um, and so uh, unfortunately <clears throat> or you leaders tend to to still suffer from attacks on, on their um, advocacy activities. You know, uh, Greta Thunberg has been, has been uh, called, um, uh, told by one a leader of one country to, to go work on her anger problem, um, you know, when, because she's agitating uh, on this. Um, and others have been told, yeah, the youth put off very nice shows, but they accomplish very little. Um, so young people, but young people today sh are increasingly sharing a common sense of anger and despair. Um, and children tend to draw on experiences from, from family members, from, from parents, cousins, uh, and, and, and others. So I think what that says for us is, is three things. And I want to close with that and open uh, the floor for discussion, because I really think this needs to be an engaging session. There are three considerations I want to put forward. One is that any action on climate change and environmental um, awareness or activity by check and by any other organizations really needs to <clears throat> emphasize people-centered action. Um, it's people's behaviors which has created uh, the current uh, climate crisis and the environmental issues that we're face facing today, the environmental threats we're facing today. But people and people's behaviors will continue to impact the environment. Therefore, people-centered approaches to climate action will become increasingly important. And I think this is good news for Czech because it means then that the space that Czech operates in, uh, that environmental uh, human ecology space, that interaction of people with the environment, what, what informs the way they interact with the environment, the things they do that have an impact on the environment and vice versa, will become an increasingly relevant theme uh, for everyone to deal. The second point I want to make is that uh, with regards to youth activism, we should encourage and support youth activism. So I'd certainly recommend that for Czech, um, that that is a new area of engagement or it becomes a priority area of engagement. Youth activism, in my view, is the key to effective climate action. Uh, and to shifting behaviors. Now, these are the young people who in 10 years, 15, 20 years time, 
would have grown up, would have been, uh, would be holding jobs and would be in key decision-making positions. Um, so check therefore has not only to get more young people engaged in its uh, activities, but it needs to find ways of amplifying their voices. We are experimenting with that. And I use the word experimenting here in a loose sense with getting young people involved um, in our activities. Uh, we did it at the air pollution conference and the webinars. We have uh, um, younger people on our board of, of directors. We're trying to engage them in leading out activities. There are some risks to that but we must find a way to give young people uh, a stronger voice. And then finally, I think um, there is a need for us to close that gap, uh, that awareness action gap on climate change. Um, there is a growing sense out there that there is need to take urgent action to combat climate uh, change, air pollution, environmental threats, and that's increasing every day. And this should not engender a shift away from awareness, I think. So some people take that to mean, oh, move away from awareness. No, I think those have to operate in parallel because what we certainly want to do is to have more action, but better informed action. Um, so awareness is not enough to move people to action, I agree. Still clear messaging uh, is necessary to ensure that young people and all other segments of society are adequately informed and therefore uh, are able to decide on what actions are most suitable or adequate for achieving any of the changes in climate change and environmental threats. So I will close with that and, uh, and then open the floor for, um, for any questions that anyone might have. I see uh, there was a first question there already. So that one was from Canada, I think, that came in and asked about how does global population influence the climate crisis, environmental threats? Um, I'm not sure if you want to take that one, uh, Emily. I, I can if you want to. Or if it's yeah, sure. Um, or, or if you want to respond to anything I say, if I miss something out. Um, yeah, that it's a it's a really good point. Global population um, increasing um, is unfortunately is not really, it can't be really stopped. Um, so we have to adapt and work better, work cleaner, um, especially with our agricultural and fishing practices. Um, uh, you know, they predicted we're, we're going to be running out of food in the next century. Um, and uh, you saw from one of my slides that um, almost two and a half billion people are living on the coast. And if sea levels are rising because of, you know, increased temperatures, those 2.5 billion people and it will only increase in increase in the future they'll have to go somewhere and you know there's there's not many places that we can just put 3 billion people um you know in 100 years so uh yeah we'll need to that needs to be taken into account yeah i, I certainly agree i mean i think uh the problem is that this burgeoning global population now is putting more pressures on the ability of the earth to sustain that at current practices and i and i emphasize that at current practices so if we continue to to with agricultural practices in the in the current trend the current methods and systems it's not sustainable if it, it puts a lot of pressure on the energy sector to meet the energy needs of everyone. But the continued use of fossil fuels uh, based energy sources is unsustainable. We all know that. So I think the, the, the quick response to, I think it was Mr. Spence or D. Spence from Canada who had posed a question is that global population uh, increases will continue to put pressures on the ability of this earth that is home to us to sustain those increasing populations. The, uh, we don't have sufficient fresh water sources. Uh, the earth cannot, um, cannot absorb all of the effluent and waste and pollution that we're spitting out there. We just cannot continue to, um, to uh, 
uh, farm out or, or plant out all areas of, of arable land with uh, for agricultural crops. And that does not have the same carbon absorbing capacity as natural forests. So I think from that perspective, something has to be, be done in terms of changing the systems. Um, there's another question here. Um, D Spence, how, well, that was the same one from Ian Douglas. Aren't there any things ordinary people should do other than vote, for example, using motor cars less, flying less, eating less meat, insulating houses, and so forth. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, you, you sort of hit the nail on the head there. Um, all those things. Um, it is funny, I, I, I've spoken to a few groups, and I, I did speak to a small group um, a few months ago, and I, I did a much longer presentation. It was just over an hour. And right at the end of it, um, you know, the, the teacher thanked me and he just said, great, so I think we can all agree that we just, you know, we need to recycle. And I just thought, well, hold, hold on. No, I think, I think the point was we need to limit our intake of plastic, limit, limit what we're um, buying in the marketplace. That was another, another point I said, use your choices in, in life and in the marketplace. And we should really try to limit the amount of plastic that we are taking. Um, certainly limit the amount of meat that you're eating um, and seafood, um, but do it in a sustainable way. Um, we, have a, we have another friend that uh, um, went vegan, which is, which is great, um, but she started off on almond milk. And I just had to be like, well, you know, almond milk's probably one of the least sustainable things that you can have. It uses way more water than, you might as well just, you know, have a burger a day and, and, and drink milk. Um, so it's, it's things like that, just um, people educating themselves, Re reading labels is a, is a really good, good way to kind of educate yourself of what you can be eating. Um, and there are several programs and, and I think even apps now that you can look up a product and it will tell you sort of the sustainability um, rating on it, which I think is really good. You know, Emily raised a really interesting point there um, because the, it's, it's current consumerism trends that really is driving all of this unsustainable practices. I mean, everybody is now so into online shopping and making sure that they can get it delivered overnight and everything, but they don't spend time looking at the places where the goods that they're, they're consuming is produced. Now, if, you, if you're purchasing goods that are produced in countries that are, are using coal-fired energy sources for, uh, for um, their industrial energy needs, then you're indirectly and directly uh, contributing to that, to that um, um, the continuation of that, of that practice. So, I mean, it's, it's yeah, I, I think people can do more individually and collectively. I was shocked when I looked at the, I think you had seen that same, um, that same um, documentary on, on the sea and, and pollution yeah. in the sea. Um, and I was doing my own research on, on um, when I wrote a blog recently, maybe two or three weeks ago on, on whether or not, uh, whether or not um, sustainable or changing current commercial fishing is key to achieving the blue charter objectives of the Commonwealth. And in that research, I found out that the plastics that we use every day, even though it's 7 million of, uh, pieces of plastics are entering the oceans every day, right? That still accounts for only about three or 4% of the total amount of plastics in, in the world's oceans. A lot of the plastics there comes from commercial sources or commercial fishing nets and, and the millions and millions of tons that have been left in the seas break down and form microplastics and stuff. So, I mean, there's so much that has to be done there. Let, let me go to another question. There's one from, um, uh, one question from the live chat that says, what actions, if any, are being taken by financial institutions to combat climate change? And is this just greenwashing? So that's an interesting one. Yeah, that's very well, the, interesting. The first phrase that came to my mind was greenwashing when uh, we said financial. Um, I do believe there are steps that that some well-intentioned financial institutions are taking. Um, for example, that Powering Past Coal Alliance uh, that I showed a little bit earlier, there are 
I think there are about 50 organizations that aren't local governments or, or countries that have signed up to um, try and phase out coal. Some of those are investment firms and financial institutions. Um, I, I used to have a slide um, until a couple of days ago on Norwegian sovereign funds. It's, it's the largest sovereign fund in the world. It's, they manage over a trillion dollars. Um, and, and the slide, you know, I, there's all this information, but when I looked into it a little bit further, I, I, I decided to take it out. The slide said, um, you know, just, just the headline. And if you look at just the headlines of the news, oh, the Norwegian sovereign fund is, is divesting from coal um, and, and they're, they're getting rid of oil and all of that. And I thought, oh, that's great, but it is Norway. And most of their investments are, it, the, the fund that they're talking about is nicknamed the oil fund. So I thought, well, that, hang on, that can't be right. So I, you know, I did a bit more research into it and uh, turned out they're, they're divesting from any new coal and oil exploration, but are still invested in fossil fuel companies as long as they have uh, either a, an interest in, in renewables or it, it was something very vague where you weren't quite sure whether are there, are they supporting renewables? Are they actually pulling out? So it's um, that, that to my mind, immediately greenwashing, um, which is just saying that you're going green and um, basically it doesn't matter. Um, although in recent years, a lot of financial institutions have instituted new divisions and, and departments, uh, all dedicated to, to ESG. And, um, you know, I think some of them are well intentioned in trying to. Um, Fulfill their fulfill their goals and and any of the SDGs that they're they're claiming to to um, uh, be a part of, um, but I I can't really see any large financial institutions um, being completely green or 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 divesting completely from fossil fuels. Yeah, I mean uh, I completely agree uh, that. Norwegian mention has been picked up by a few countries and they're now saying that in their overseas development uh, funding, they will not be funding any initiatives that uh, um, support uh, fossil fuel based activities. So it's quite nebulous the way it's discussed, but there's no mention of, the, of what they're doing in their national capacities or whether or not they're continuing to invest in things. So, you do have, uh, and I've spoken to people in, in developing countries in the Commonwealth who've said, yeah, that's only a ploy to get us out of our own oil exploration and to get us into renewable because then they want to come in. And so Guyana, for instance, is, is brand new, has had uh, this major discovery of oil. And they're like, no, nah. so I spoke to someone from there who said, no, I'm not going to, we're not going to be following what they're doing. They want to get us out of oil. And into into new areas, so it's 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 thrown up some interesting responses. So, we have a question here from Jeffrey Payne saying, given that many of the world's major cities are extremely vulnerable to sea level rise, what policies would help to reduce exposure, especially by the poor who live in the most vulnerable parts of those cities? Um, yeah, I mean the 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 one main example I can think of at the moment is Bangladesh. Um, with, I think it's something like a, a few inches or even up to a meter a year is disappearing from the coastline, especially in the Bay of Bengal. Um, and the policy there, I'm not quite sure. I know people have just been leaving. Um, I can think about, um, as I mentioned, Kiribati, unfortunately had to, had to purchase land in another country. That's that's not a great policy, but at least they're thinking ahead, knowing that at some point their nation might just disappear. Um, but I think one one good thing and, and a project that, that Chuck was uh, heavily involved in is in mangroves. And I think that's something that can has been proven scientifically to stop um, many effects of typhoons and cyclones and, and any of the natural disasters, as well as any tidal waves. Um, so that's certainly something that um, a greener policy, um, especially on coastal areas that can support mangroves, would, would be a really good start. Um, and 
yeah, that's sort of all I can think of at the moment. Let's yeah, I mean, I, I'd yeah. like to add to that, Emily, that, that what certainly could be done is if countries could adopt policies and implement policies which help to effectively lift people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. If you look at um, many of the practices for uh, poor people, uh, the use of uh, uh, biomass for fuel, wood and stuff, it is, it is a function of the economic situation they're faced with. They can't afford uh, LPG, renewable gas or anything else for cooking. This is what they can afford to go out and forage um, in, in the garbage dumps and in the forest to, to clear uh, the lands to, to use those uh, for fuel. So, and you also find that the burning of, um, of uh, garbage dump sites in many countries now, especially in Africa, it's a growing problem, is because these are people who are very poor, have no source of income. So what they do is they burn all of these electronic waste televisions, radios, anything that has copper wiring or different types of metals in them. They burn off so that the plastics would melt and then they extract all of this, uh, these uh, precious metals, copper, everything else that could be used, uh, can have good conductive capacity. And then they take them those, uh, take those down to these smelting centers that produce them, they get paid for it. And that's how they earn their, their daily. But I think a, a good policy response is going to be lifting people out of poverty uh, so that they can uh, afford uh, to live in, in better ways. So um, Ian said, my point is that action needs to be taken at all levels in the home, in the community, in the business and local government, in the state and country government, national governments and multinational corporations and the UN system. I completely agree. I mean, I, I don't know if you, th you think that kind of a multi-sectoral, multi-societal or multi-level approach within society is necessary. Exactly, 100%. Um, Mark, I think you had a question. Well, I, I just want to chip in on what you said about Bangladesh, Emily, because mm -hmm. uh, I was based there for two years just after its liberation, working as personal assistant to the chief of what was then the biggest UN relief operation ever mounted. And um, I, you know, I was astonishing in those days, one third of the country would go underwater even then um due to monsoons and i can't Im imagine what happens now the population was vast but it's much much vaster today and um uh, yet somehow the country still manages to remain positive and uh indeed has done all sorts of things to uh, Im improve itself in the intervening period but i'm just so glad you you, you raised it as an example yeah, I agree. So D. Spencer, let's face it, we're in the middle of evolutionary changes, not just revolutionary shifts, and perhaps we need to consider not just preservation and conservation, but also adaptability and flexibility. I, I think he, ha he has a point there. But D. Spencer, you also raised a, a concept earlier about ecophilia. Can you share with us more what ecophilia is? I've never heard the term before. I'd be happy to learn what ecophilia is, so I can I can walk away with my uh, I've learned something new today uh, beyond what else has been said. Well, if you would like me to respond to that, uh, that was uh, just an off the cuff kind of okay. Uh, okay. creativity moment that I had, and I would think that ecophilia is in opposition to eco anxiety and that uh, we need to uh, perhaps spend more time in loving uh, ecology, uh, spending more time uh, caressing the uh, natural world uh, on our knees, planting trees, um, and uh, whether they be in the city or in the forests, in the wild, um, uh, it's just uh, an off-the-cuff kind of uh, response to eco-anxiety that we need to balance that with ecophilia. Uh, that, that's that an yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think, Emily, if I can respond, I, I think I completely agree with you that we cannot just approach the matter from a perspective of anxiety. At some point, somebody has to actually be uh, in appreciation of the environment. And I think that when, um, when we hear our closing comments from the, um, 
from our, our closing speaker today, she will mention some things on that because I think it's a very powerful message. Uh, and I think it goes back to the point I made about messaging. If it's only the negative, of course, you're going to drive everybody to, to be acting from a position of fear. But what about acting from a position of appreciation and about a difference? So we, we have Nicholas Watts who's joined us and he said, my question is what are the best sources for current data on environmentally benign consumer habits? such as eating less meat, is there evidence of a generational change? Um, and then another question came in after that from Jane Samuel. Samuel. So Emily, I'm not sure if you want to take up that one on, um, on statistical uh, information. I try to stay away from the statistics because I've gotten to learn a lot <laughs> statistics, say anything we wanted to say. So um, I, will, I will take a look. I've got a, um, what I'll actually do now, I'll send a file out of the further reading and resources. I've got about um, 20 something links to different to various uh, statistical analysis and um, information uh, just so everybody can kind of get there, you know, see where I've got my presentation information from. Um, so I think there'll be one of the links in there. It's, um, it's gone on my head at the moment of which one yeah. for that, um, but hopefully it'll be on there and you can take a look. I will send the file over now. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say that I, I, I don't eat less meat because of environmental issues because I don't believe in that argument. And I, 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 I had, uh, a quite a, a healthy debate with someone who said, no, 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 I won't have that. I will only have soya and matcha uh, because it's for the environment and protecting the environment. And I had to say, do you know how much deforestation has been caused by soya production? It's, it's larger than the state of Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands and Spain combined right now. That's yeah. the amount of deforestation as well. But it's an, it's an interesting point now, and I think that's the debate that rages on. Jane Samuel says, question, I recently discovered my water provider is third highest in country for dumping raw waste into rivers and seas in their overflows. And that's from a gardener. This is an example where we as consumers are locked into paying providers we do not want to support. How do we organize our time to challenge and address all this issue or all these issues in our busy lives? That's quite an interesting question, actually. So, and it, it goes back to the heart of what we're talking about about mobilizing people to action. Um, and it's often, Jane. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I hope you were here with us when we were talking about the fact that um, oftentimes it is until someone has a personal or direct experience with an environmental threat or issue that they become activists, um, which I think is important um, and we should not try to dissuade that from happening. But how do you respond to that? I, I mean, I think lobbying, in my view, lobbying everyone who is affected by it and, and having the voices amplified is always a good way. And putting forward proposals or solutions or you think, and then vent, uh, ventilating that issue in the public, letting everyone know that this is how people feel about it. I'm not sure if there's a consultative process in the UK for things like that. Uh, uh, Nicola said soya is fed to beef. Well, I'm not a soya eater, Nicola, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't like soya at all. So. Um, I wonder, I wonder if I could just sort of briefly interrupt. I just wanted, I just noted that Czech's president, uh, who's nine, has tuned in from like Nigeria, and I just wanted to say welcome to uh, Levy Aguiki, a former Nigerian senator who's joined us. Excellent, excellent. So, uh, what is the African playing in this challenge? That's from Cecilia Anim. So what is the African playing in the challenge? I, I'm not sure I understand. I, I, I guess it must mean uh, what role is Africa playing in responding to the challenge or in in contributing to the climate ch uh, um, change and environmental threat issues. I'm not sure if you have that information, uh, Emily. Um, just sort of more broadly, um, I know that Africa is probably the one of the most affected areas for climate change and they're the contributing the least um, uh, to the effects of it. Um, I know there's a lot of, um, <clears throat> What's called leap leapfrogging technology, which is which is really fantastic to see. There's a lot of uh, solar uh, yeah. being put in areas where there there wasn't even a grid before. Um, so it's sort of leapfrog. You don't you don't need these grids anymore. We, people can just 
runoff of solar. Um, and same things happening in India. But in, in Africa, there are there are movements. There's um, her name escapes me. There's a there's a youth activist from Uganda, and she's she's just doing great things. She's you know she's spoken at the UN. Um, she's really trying to highlight that um, you know the problems in Africa that you know they're they're not causing uh, most of the problems, um, but they're being affected by it. Um, but other data, I don't have any specific data on. on yeah. So uh, Nicholas has put forward a, a very useful response to Jane's question, and he said that the UK consumer response to the European Super League and the turnaround of the ESL is an encouraging example of what can be achieved by citizen mobilization. So, and I, I, and I tend to agree. I mean, I think unless citizens mobilize around issues that affect them um, collectively, uh, it's it's very difficult to get single voices heard uh, or listened to, not just heard, but listened to. So that, that's, a very, uh, that's a very, very important one. So Another really good example, I think, was um, uh, yesterday or the day before, uh, there was an announcement by Barclays. They had um, said, oh, we're going to be investing in this company. And this company was um, uh, prisons for profit uh, somewhere in Alabama. And uh, they seemed kind of proud of it. And by the end of the day, there was so much outrage and so many people um, kind of coming after them that they pulled out of the deal, like, you know, four or five hours later. So another thing that, that can be achieved by just everybody sort of informing themselves of what the issue was. Um, and, and I thought that was really fantastic because it's one of those things that I didn't think most people would even read or care about, you know, oh, Barclays is doing some kind of merger here or, this bank is doing that. Um, so that was really great to see that, that mobilization. And it, it happened within a couple hours, sort of like, not, not on the level of the, the Super League, but. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nicholas has clarified the point there. I mean, I think the important message there for Czech and other Commonwealth organizations is that we have a key role to play in identifying critical issues that require um, that type of mobilization, uh, um, consumer societal mobilization. And I think if we do our jobs in, in creating awareness around those issues, highlighting them, emphasizing them, sharing information, I think we can help uh, to feed uh, that movement uh, of people saying, yeah, we want to respond to that. So Beatrice, uh, where Vinu has said to avoid anxiety aspect, how about sharing more examples of sustainable experiences? For example, there's a successful documentary called Tomorrow um, by Cyril Dion. It shows many actions in several fields and several countries. I agree. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Um, and, and I think that's, that echoes the sentiment, the earlier sentiment that the messaging needs to shift from being just about the environmental threats and anxieties and climate change uh, issues to the positive experiences and what people are doing, how what they're doing to overcome um, those issues. And I think if I can use the moment to just go back to our um, air pollution conference from uh, the Ramphal Institute, one of the messages there that we tried to get was that the Commonwealth is already doing quite a lot of things but that message is not getting out and it's, uh, it's all disparate activities. So you don't have that consensus that, you know, that snowballing effect that, oh, there's much happening here. And I think that's important uh, and to consider. Um, any final questions before I turn it over to uh, Ms. Kame Palma for um, uh, closing out our event today or giving the closing remarks? Anyone, I'm just looking here. Um, if not, then let me just uh, um, hand over to you, uh, Kami, if you're able to light up your video and microphone that I can come off. On oh my. There you are. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Um, and I will say my, my bigger thank yous towards the end. Um, just very quickly to you, Mark, for asking me to, to close off today. Um, when I started thinking about 
how best to close off without knowing what Emily would be speaking about. And, and of course, not knowing how David would, re would respond to what I, I didn't know was being spoken about. It occurred to me <clears throat> that in 2015, I led uh, a huge gathering of, of uh, teachers of the Roman Catholic uh, missions in Belize. And the essence of that particular um, conference of, of teachers was for us to look at what had just been recently released in May of 2015 by Pope, Pope Francis, when he delivered his encyclical called Laudato Si. And the subtitle of Laudato Si is care for our common home. So I want to start with that today. <clears throat> The underlying theme of Laudato Si is that of stewardship and our obligation to hold and to tend our earth for each other and for generations to come. To love and respect our earth for everyone, for every creature, for every organism, for every element with whom and with which we share our arts. In Care for Our Common Home, the Pope injected a moral force linking people with their environment. He lamented environmental degradation and global warming. He called on the peoples of the world to take swift and unified global action in order to tackle poverty, inequality, and social justice. So humanity has, in fact, we have a responsibility to change current behaviors in order to mitigate climate change and to protect Earth's environment. The environmental and climate change issues we face today are directly the result of our decades, if not centuries long, behaviors and preferences. In the words of President Biden today, this is a decisive decade and we must act with urgency. I believe that the Commonwealth Human Ecology Council check, check's focus on human ecology will become increasingly important as a space for policy development in the Commonwealth. As climate change and environmental changes continue to impact on people particularly women and young people. The latter group, children and young people, will be the center of the storm as climate change worsens. They will increasingly be affected in every way, and I'm voicing David's words here too. Organizations such as CHEC, the Rampal Institute, and others within and outside of the Commonwealth, therefore have a responsibility for supporting youth-led responses to climate change and for giving youth stronger voices on the issue. After all, it is their future which is at stake and we cannot therefore sit back and do nothing. Thank you, Emily, for delivering such an impressive presentation. May I be bold? in asking now for a copy of your presentation. The, the, I'd love to have that PowerPoint. Sure, of course. Some of, good. Some of the issues you raise, such as the fact that we have, we have and will continue to have climate refugees and, uh, and the preparation of government, such as Kiribati in preparing for this. Very, very interesting. In 2009, I recall when I was High Commissioner in the United Kingdom, um, my colleague from the Maldives encouraged me to, to follow this because her president, the president of the Maldives, was holding his cabinet underwater. Was it a gimmick? Perhaps. But he wanted to bring attention to the coastal erosion and the plight of his island state. The issue that you brought up, Emily, also about garbage patches in our seas and oceans that issue comes home to me in a personal way as we experience this every year here on the coast of Belize. I live on the coast and the, 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 the 
plastic and the garbage that comes in mainly from our neighboring countries. I found the concept of eco-anxiety eco most interesting. Um, and I will have to read up a little bit more about that. Thank you, David, for your very strong response and the fact that you emphasize that we must have a people-centered approach to climate action. I so agree with you. And most importantly, David, thank you for pointing out the absolute need, indeed the crucial need for our youth to be involved. I'm not really into the Bible, but it just brought up an idea as I was writing my notes as you spoke. So please allow my biblical illusion here. For they, the youth, shall inherit this earth. And we as stewards, our governments must put policies in place to ensure that our children and our grandchildren, I mention this because I have two who are dearest to me, inherit a healthy earth for generations to come. I want to take this opportunity to thank the chair of Czech. Commonwealth Human Ecology Council, Mark Robinson. Thank you, Mark, for asking me to close and thanks to your trustees uh, for organizing, you and your trustees for organizing this event on Earth Day 2021. And thank you also for seeking to partner with the Rampal Institute on this very important day. Thank you. Could I just... Um... Can I, can I just say, in a final closing act, I'm so grateful to um, those who have been able to uh, join this discussion, who've listened. Uh, I know that we've also had um, people tuning in on YouTube. And um, I just hope you all feel that this was a, a worthwhile occasion to mark not just Earth Day, but also the day when uh, President Biden uh, brought 40 heads of government together uh, for a virtual meeting. And um, it is good that, that the British government too is very strongly behind this. And I'm sure that both Czech, the Ramphal Institute and other like-minded organizations will want to um, make their views known when we come to COP26. Thank you all.